Yeah. Take the time to see the six pages of quilt faces, beautiful faces. Without masks, you get to look in each other's eyes without masks. <laughs> <laughs> This is great. Hmm. <laughs> so, take the time. Mary Murphy. Yay, everybody. Audrey. Yay. The Vancouver Vanguard, the East Coast, Sangha. Japan, Japan. <laughs> Paris, <laughs> Honolulu, Japan. Yay, so many places. Wow. <laughs> mm. Pari. Kyoto, Melbourne. The vineyard. <laughs> Paris. Takes longer to say hi on Sundays. <laughs> have to go around the world. Yeah. <laughs> Ready. Ready. All right. Color is nurture, seeing consciousness. So take in, in, take in the color and the emotion that comes along with what we see, the appreciation, both of color and of seeing and the objects our beings that we're lucky to see. All in the body, not out there. Everything we need is here. And we're all here in support of that, protected by the, the stillness. So as you take in a few deep breaths, see if you can feel that, that nurture of stillness, like the nurture of color and sound and sensation, fragrance and flavor. Stillness uh, as a stream not as a rigid, unmoving place, like the vastness of the sky. And like the vastness, of the sky in the stillness, Just noticing the patterns of experience, palette of colors, field of sound vibrations, 
inward or outward. The plexus of body sensations felt at once from within the body or in and around the body, if we wrap awareness around and throughout the body. And the sense of settling in the, the spaces between as if we're just leaning back in the silence and spaces between thoughts, emotions, sensations, the silence of this exists that makes music beautiful, the silence within the symphony, between the sounds. Herein is where we find that ground of abiding and the awareness of, of what is. It's the currently arising sensations if we're anchored within the body or anchored in the breath, the sensations that arise as the breath moves expands and contracts, rises and falls, the myriad changing, ephemeral, subtle, stronger or intense, but always momentary sensations within a single breath. smooth or grainy, soft or textured. So as part of the intention our motivation for being present, anchoring in this awareness and the stillness, attuned to the nature of impermanence, phenomena in constant change, body stream the heart, mind, stream. So, accompanying the intention to abide in this awareness of changing phenomena. It's calling in the equanimity, the emotional, emotion of subtle balance of heart, subtle serenity, close to our unified with the stillness that we're abiding in. So it becomes an equanimous awareness. That we're attuned to changing phenomena Phenomena always disappearing, so often unreliable, shaky, vulnerable. But with that liberating understanding that it's also not controllable. So that there's nothing worth clinging to. Noticing how that itself is an equanimous, abiding awareness.
You might even notice a difference in the Brahma Vihara equanimity that we've been practicing this weekend, which is relational. The emotion of mental equipoise toward our own body, mind, toward all other beings and all other phenomena, places, property. Out of this equanimity to, toward beings, places, and property we establish a skillful, a skillful means relationship in the, the interaction with other beings, interaction with our possessions, places, property. So it's the equanimity that navigates daily life, the way of the world, the conditions of the world. And notice with the Vipassana equanimity, it's particularly attuned to the very momentary nature. This, the, the manusha or sankharas or dhammas, physical phenomena, mental phenomena, emotional phenomena, stream of thought, impinging sounds and light, this continuous display of phenomena that when we abide doing nothing, this finely tuned observing awareness is unaffected by the impermanence, by the change, by pleasant falling away or unpleasant arising. It's a steady, serene anchoring. Vipassana Upeka. Keeping the silent awareness on track, anchored in stillness, attuned to change. responsive to life as it is, just as it is, without reactivity, grasping, pushing away, denying, clinging. The even-hearted presence
in the last minutes of the sitting. Have a sense of the accumulated qualities of heart from this sitting, the accumulation of abiding in stillness, the calm or insight, collectedness that comes from that, the ease, the peace. Whatever may arise and be directly felt And scanning the body, and scanning the heart. Aware of the pasture of peace from the equanimity element, or the field of flower blooms of metta, compassion joy are the deep rooted center holding everything together from the wisdom of equanimity and appreciating these qualities even if they only seem like memory but knowing that they've touched your heart, extend to everyone here, extend to our Sangha, the well-wishing of metta now filled and empowered by this reflection of our the goodness of our practice, the treasures, the blooms. The letting go from attuning to the impermanent nature of things. The resulting care and equanimity all these we can offer as part of our practice to our Sangha as, as nurture, as a gift to empower and support everyone else's practice. And aware everyone is, is sending all of us, each of us, the same gift of goodness from their depth, the abiding in this equanimous awareness, all the, the fields, the bloom of goodness.
Thank you, Steve. Well, mostly the um, talk today is about equanimity, but hopefully including the um, wisdom side of the Vipassana and also some of the first three Brahma Viharas. As I'm um, sitting here um, looking out the window, uh, I can mostly see Vag, which is uh, the volcanic ash from the volcano on the big island. And um, at a certain point, even the horizon disappears. It's, it's amazing to notice this. Um, the Vag just hides everything like any detail, like fog. And I, re I remembered uh, when Sayada Upandita came to the Big Island to offer a retreat in 1986. Uh, and at that retreat, the volcano went off. And in, in Hawaii, uh, it's not only just believed, but accepted that uh, the volcano is a, a goddess, the fire goddess Pele. It's like it's not something that is a questionable um, thing that not only does she exist, but she's deeply revered. But that's not necessarily the more modern uh, Western uh, belief system. But uh, if you live here, you feel her immense power of destruction and creativity. This is how all the land has been built, created in Hawaii. But anyway, at the end of that retreat, some uh, yogi asked Sayada Upandita whose karma it, it is when the volcano goes off. And what was so moving to me, uh, having lived here already for some years in, in Honolulu, was that he had such respect for her, Pele. Like he, it can make me cry. It was just like so um, moving to me that not only did he believe in her, but that he had that reverence and respect and how he spoke of her. And he said, oh, um, he said, Pele Devi, <laughs> Pele Devi. He said it was um, all of our karma that lived here. It was Pele's karma that the volcano went off. But I think it surprised everybody that he said it was every, all beings who lived on the big island, all the fish, you know, all the insects, all the human beings, all the Davis, her karma. Um, it was all of our karma that the volcano got, went off. And, and I find that um, it's not easy when you can't really breathe with the vog <clears throat> living on this island but one um, accepts that if one lives here, it's the karma. It's the karma, the causes and conditions of life here. It includes, includes the, the fire and the creation of land. It's uh, very moving, very primal <laughs> living here. Uh, I wasn't going to start with that, but the Vogue was so um, powerful. I thought it was helpful. And also because equanimity practice is all about understanding ownership of action and comma, it, it really relates. This is a small poem by Emily Dickinson, number A252 of her envelope poems. She used to write poems on little envelopes of letters she sent. In this short life that only merely lasts an hour, how much, how little is within our power? I think that's an incredible poem. 
poem of what a question in this fleeting life that only merely lasts an hour, how quickly it goes, how quickly this retreat has passed, how much, how little is within our power. You know, what are the limits of what we can control in this life, in this fleeting life? And that on a deep level, there's no contradiction in the paradox of that, how much, how little. A lot of us know the story of the Buddha-to-be that um, witnessed the four heavenly messengers. Uh, and I don't want to do a long story about it, but the short version is that um, there was a prophecy about the Buddha when he was born, the Buddha-to-be, that he was either going to become a great political leader or a spiritual leader, a great spiritual leader. And his father did not want him to be a great spiritual leader. And so he protected him his whole life from any kind of suffering as best he could. And, you know, he was a king and could do that. He had a different palace for the Buddha to be for each season so that he wouldn't suffer if it was too rainy or, you know, amazing, amazing kind of intensity of protection from dukkha, from the undependability of even the seasons, winter, summer, the heat, the cold, the rain. But when the Buddha hit a certain point, a certain age, of course, especially given this prophecy, he, he was pulled to um, search and inquire and deeply, deeply search for the truth. And uh, this was after he was married and had a child. Uh, he was trying to leave the palace and uh, his father would clear everything, any sign of anybody old, anybody sick, anybody dead. Um, but uh, Deva started conjuring up an image, uh, you know, an actual image of someone dead. When he was le left, he conjured up an image that, that as he was driving out in the chariot. Um, and he was so shaken. He asked the charioteer, is this going to happen to me? And the charioteer said, yes. And he said, does this happen to everyone? And he said, yes. And it just, that this, this just knocked him out. He had to go back to the palace. It happened four times. The deva conjured up somebody old, somebody sick, somebody dead. And each time he would ask the charioteer, is this going to happen to me? Is this going to happen to everyone I know? Yes. Uh, but then the fourth time, the deva conjured up the image of a um, renunciate, a monk. The translation is someone more peaceful than peace itself. someone more peaceful than peace itself. And it had such a deep, profound impact. All of these had an impact. Heavenly messengers, heavenly, why? Because they were, you know, just this incredible message to wake up, that he could wake up and be free. So I've had, um, a number of opportunities to actually with all the heavenly messengers <laughs> since my mother died when I was young and was sick um, and I did have that experience when I saw my mom's body and touched the cold body in the casket when I was young and I it was like an electric uh, lifetime shock of like wow same thing is this going to happen to me is this going to happen to everyone? Yes. You know, it's deeply inspired me to search. I didn't know that teaching yet, but it had the same 
affect mortality. Yeah, anicca, impermanence. So one, one time I was um, cooking at uh, IMS in Massachusetts in 1979, and uh, Mahasi Sayadaw came to teach there with a number of other monks. And it was a three week retreat in the some early summer, June, uh, May, May. Um, and he, he's known to be fully enlightened and also an incredible scholar, very revered monk, uh, teacher in Burma, very revered, not only because of his deep freedom and teaching and scholarly abilities, but also because he opened up the practice to lay people. I often think when I look at the quilt faces that the causes, one of the causes is because of Mahasi Sayadaw that we're all together. One of the beautiful causes and conditions, karma. Uh, I had not, I'd only done one retreat before that. And uh, it's a long story again, but the short version is nobody, <laughs> well, we only were allowed four cooks. There were 140 people, yogis at the retreat and all these monks across the street to take care of. So I offered to also uh, cook for Mahasi and the monks with a cook that they sent from Burma. Um, and I would go over there about two in the morning and maybe a little earlier and, and um, when I would open the door and walk in, I would feel like I had been um, given an elephant tranquilizer it was, it was such a different energy field. Really, the energy field was equanimity. I mean, it was like something I'd never, it would, I mean, some, someone more peaceful than peaceful, peace itself, I, it, it, it doesn't even cover it. It was so peaceful. It would just hit me like, oh, ah, oh, it just, it was like my, my energetics, especially then, are pretty hopped up. And it would just be like, calm, 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 calm. Like it was just, um, the impact w was indescribable. So I'd sort of <laughs> kind of recover from it and try to try to shift gears into 10 billion gears lower than what I used to, you know, and uh, walk in. And um, I didn't find out until I sat with Upandita in 1984 that, um, the cook was a meditation master himself. Uh, nobody knew that. Um, and it was incredible to, to be there with him cooking in that, in that place. What a heavenly messenger. And about halfway through, um, I, burned, I burned my finger really badly. Uh, really badly. And my natural inclination would be to yell, ow, you know, like, ah, it really hurts, right? Like, of course, in this place, it would have sounded very um, inappropriate. But the, the cook <laughs> could tell I really burned it. And he, he came over and he could tell I was about to scream. And he came over and he, t and he held my finger with so much kindness, like with his hand, he held it. And he said, burning, burning, burning. <laughs> and I was like, Argh! and he's like, say, say it, say it, say it. And I'm like, okay, you know, burning, burning, burn, burn. And he, he kept doing that burning, burning, say it again, burning, burning, burning until what? I could accept it was just burning simply burning, it's okay. It was so any, of course I ran it under cold water, got some ice, but it's like, um, it, again, it was just such a revelation that you didn't, you could have the physical pain without the reaction that you, I could respond. But the, by the time he finished saying burning, 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 like it was like, and he was holding it with so much metta. Um, I was just, we were both, giggling quite quietly because of course there's no hardly any sound in that house but it was really amazing to have something really went in 
with for me just not not just a soft mental note of oh being with the experience saying it very softly but also getting that it helped me to accept without conditions that it happened that it was painful really painful and that it was okay it was fire element okay right So in that time period in that house with the Mathasi and the other monks, Usi, Wananda, Ujjanaka, Jataka, it was amazing. And um, I kind of learned it kind of kinesthetically through osmosis that quiet, real quiet is not the absence of noise. It's the absence of that reactivity, right, to the the pain in the world, the, the joy and the sorrow, of course, with equanimity, but it was a real, again, kinesthetic absorption of something that I knew to be true, that it's, um, that we are capable of not having to be oppressed by greed, hatred, and delusion. And there's a, a later in life getting to Burma and uh, having so many beings there, more peaceful than peace itself to uh, connect with. And the Myatang Sayadaw, the happy Sayadaw that I met later in life, um, going to his monastery, it, it had that atmosphere a lot of them there do the nunneries and monaries of so quiet, but not the absence of noise. So peaceful, but there can be children running through and um, cooking happening and people visiting, but it's, it's quiet. And I remember what struck me so much about the happy Sayadaw that we call him the happy Sayadaw, he's the happiest being I've ever met, was that when someone asked him a question, he would always lean forward and laugh and just like, he'd be like really lean forward and there'd be so much loving kindness, just like so much connecting with loving kindness. And the, you know, this is the metta, the karuna, the mudita, so much of that connecting with the, the kindness, the compassion for any pain, that mudita for any, our joy, just that deep connecting with the Brahma Vihara. Um, and then when he would answer the question, he, he had a chair that went pretty far back. He would always go way back <laughs> and just go into this deep, deep peace. No chit chat. Nothing extra, very quiet, very peaceful. But then the next question, seamless, right? Love and wisdom, love and wisdom, love and wisdom. So someone more peaceful than peace itself doesn't mean not connected, yeah, not deeply connected, but also deeply disenchanted with greed, hatred, and delusion. Not oppressed, not caught by it. Uh, when I was about 45, my middle sister got ovarian cancer. And uh, it was stage four when she found out. And she uh, went through the next four years mm. trying hard to um, stay alive till her son graduated from high school which she managed to do. <clears throat> and whenever I've gone to Burma so many times now in um, the month of January, one of the things that have always affected me very deeply is um, there's chanting on the loudspeakers at night, morning, anytime, but um, 
there's a particular chant that they do called the Patanas, and it's all about causation. It's amazing. It's really all about karma. But um, the, the shortest version of it is seven days and seven nights. And the monks and nuns all over the um, Sagain Hills, where the monastery we go to, to Chichen is, uh, they come from all over the hills to chant, to take turns chanting 24 seven, seven days, seven nights. But it's so well loved and so uh, appreciated that sometimes it goes on for weeks. Uh, I think sometimes for months, I've never been there that long. Uh, and the, the, the tune of it, I don't know the words, but the tune of it has always affected me so deeply. Um, and it, it's kind of like, da 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 it's beautiful and it's just, it's like awesome to fall asleep to, to wake up to, to practice to, to teach in. You know, it's an atmosphere. Again, the ch we, we don't always appreciate what chanting does. Like it's creating this atmosphere of peace to um, abide in or the metta chanting of the atmosphere of love and peace. And so that, chant kept coming to me when my sister was um, going through her last years and when she died um, this came to me it's in English <clears throat> and what's I'm offering it today I rarely do but because it's um, if you hear in it what it it's all three, the first three Brahma Viharas, the Metta, Karuna, Mudita. But in with each phrase, there's the equanimity. And I think this is so important again to get that each of the loving kindness is means it's unconditional love means that it's infused with equanimity. And compassion, karuna, it means that the caring about pain is infused with equanimity. It, it, it couldn't be unconditional without it. And the third mudita, it's in the joy, the appreciative joy, appreciating the joy in the world and the gratitude for it. It's infused with equanimity, except unconditional acceptance that things are just as they are. May we be happy and peaceful, and may we know things are just as they are. May we be happy and peaceful, and may we know things are just as they are. May we care about each other's suffering and may we know things are just as they are. May we care about each other's suffering and may we know things are just as they are. May we appreciate the joy in our lives and may we know things are just as they are. May we appreciate the joy in our lives and may we know things are just as they are. So, and may we know things are just as they are. The meaning of that is all of all beings 
we're all living out our karma together, right? We're all living out joy and sorrow, pain and pleasure, fame, disrepute, gain and loss, the Lokadama way of the world, all beings that take birth, live out the fleetingness of life and the karma of life, that deep karma. Moving on, the Buddha taught the details of why this pain or this kind of suffering or this joy is imponderable, imponderable, unfathomable. And yet we can understand enough that all we need to do is learn how to live it out well with the Brahma Viharas, with the wisdom as best we can. And the equanimity practice is abiding in this understanding. It's connecting with living out the karma together and it's abiding in this deep understanding. Assuming that we have, as in my chant, you have all three Brahma Viharas there and then, but they're including things are as they are. And this includes all the unnecessary pain that we find so unacceptable that we can't fathom can be happening, right? And so the Buddha isn't teaching that we condone unnecessary suffering or that when we accept unconditional acceptance does not mean we're saying <laughs> unnecessary uh, suffering is right. What is being said is that it's happening. Hunger in this world is happening. You know, whatever, all the, all the political craziness, the racial injustice, you know, added global warming, all that, it's like, there's so much. The history of childhood is enough to knock you for a loop, right? So it's like, it's just unfathomable, right? All the suffering and all the joy, right? There's so much joy, there's so much beauty. And yet where we have trouble with karma is not usually with the joy and the beauty. It's with the, if you look carefully, you can even totally get old and die and be pretty reasonable about it, right? You had your, you had your time, you know, it's fleeting, it's, it's, there's mortality, but there's so much more that we find so hard to grasp. And yet it is, it is unfathomable. And it's more just getting the senses, how do we make the effort the, the, the right effort, not only to attempt to be liberated from greed, hatred, and delusion ourselves. Like, it's like, what a noble thing to get out of the way, to get, to be peaceful, to really be peaceful. The attempt in a lifetime to be free from greed, hatred, and delusion is almost impossible but it's possible, right? And just to be able to aspire to that, but to also want to alleviate as much suffering as we can as we go along and to choose places where we really can be helpful and to know that we're doing that because it's the right thing to do, right? It's, it's, the, it's the noble thing to do to find where our limits, where we can be helpful, where we can alleviate unnecessary suffering, but to watch out for burnout because the burnout happens when we get attached to the result of our effort. And that includes our spiritual practice. People get give up, get feel defeated because more, <laughs> there's more fear down the road, you know, and, you know, they, it's like doubt or like you, you work out your whole lifetime to like try to help and poverty, and it's there's still poverty. But it's the little me, it's the little ego that's that's feeling defeated. It's like the actual effort to do it is what matters. The spirit of being free from greed, hatred, and delusion, inwardly or outwardly, all of that, the practice helps us to get that if we anything we do in practice or 
trying to help anything in the world. If you do it with full effort, without any attachment to the result, there is no burnout. It's not possible. But that's hard to do, right? So you take breaks. When you feel defeated, you know, you go under, you go in the trenches, right? You take a break, you build up energy, you rest, you rest. If you feel defeated, you rest. There's nothing wrong with feeling defeated. It means we got attached to the result of the effort. And that's easy to do as a human. Very easy. And curable. You take a break, build up the energy, and say it open to called energy. Courageous, courageous effort. Courageous effort. Equanimity is a deep rest. It's the deepest relief. It's the deepest rest. It's the deepest peace without conditions. Being in the moment as the collective and personal individual karma unfolds, it's like it's meeting each moment without conditions. But, but equanimity includes all imperfection. It includes everything. So that when, we, when the equanimity disappears, when there is no equanimity and say, and we want it back, we want it back so badly. Perfection includes all imperfection, right? So that when the wanting appears, if there's enough awareness, we just go, oh, it's like burning, burning. We go wanting, wanting, burning, burning, wanting, wanting. It's okay. You don't have to be oppressed by it. It's, you don't have to feel like defeated. It's just wanting. And then if you can't see it that clearly, you do compassion for the wanting or matter for the wanting. And if that doesn't work, you take a walk, <laughs> you take a break, right? You know, it's like, you take a break, a rest. There are many different kinds of rest. Equanimity is the deepest peace, the deepest rest. But if we're getting caught and getting upset and can't see it clearly, you just have all the metta and compassion for yourself and appreciate the goodness of yourself. You take a walk, and if that doesn't work, you healthily distract yourself. So it's like all good practice. Sometimes I think that we think that if we accept, unconditionally accept how things are, it's going to make all the pain go away. It doesn't. It makes the reaction, it makes the noise go away. The little me isn't in charge. Greed, hatred, and delusion is the little me. That's all. We have great kindness for the little me, great compassion, great joy. But we just can't let the little me be in charge. We see plenty of places where that happens. <laughs> Hmm. So hopefully, we appreciate these times together, the Sunday sitting, particularly the sense of um, coming together with a refuge of in Sangha and the refuge in, in a time together more peaceful than peace itself. The refuge in Sangha is a heavenly messenger. It's meant to be an oasis in this world. 
it's meant to be a place of rest that we can get inspired and to find courage and joy and rejoice in that courage or rejoice in the rest. So I'd like to end with a um, poem by Li Po, Chinese poet who lived in the 700s in China. He lived at a time similar to now for us. where he had to dig deep to find peace. It's a time we just need to dig deep to find peace. The water is there. The water of peace and love is there. Just you have to take the time to dig for it. So this is called Question and Answer on the Mountain. You ask me why I live on this green mountain. I smile, no answer. My heart serene on flowing water. Peach blossom quietly floats away. No likeness to that human world below. So at times I wish for all of us that our hearts be serene on the flowing water of our kar karma unfolding moment by moment. We can do it. Well, thanks to everyone for joining us on uh, Sunday. Um, for those who are not part of the uh, weekend retreat, just know that next Sunday we'll sort of be back to our normal format of a, a sitting, a talk, and then a question and answer period. Um, but for now, those of us who are on the weekend retreat to finish, we just invite you to do some walking and come to the metta chant at four or you know, the top of the hour, wherever you are. And for the rest, um, we look forward to seeing you again next, next weekend. And um, feel free to leave a message to folks in the chat on your way out. And um, take good care of yourselves.
So good to see. Good to see everybody. <laughs> nice song. Take care. Mm-hmm. <sighs>